Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Amir Abdukor. Uh, I'm a nephrologist at Loma Linda University uh, Medical Center, uh, and I'll be uh, moderating this uh, uh, excellent talk that we're going to uh, listen in a few minutes. Uh, before uh, 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 introduce our speaker, I just want to uh, have a uh, statement that uh, needs to be said, um, and that uh, is that Opus Medicus is um, uh, designed this course for a maximum of 1.0 uh, AMA PRA category. Uh, I would like to introduce our um, speaker, Dr. Azarowski, um, who is an MD and a PhD and a graduate of Stanford School of Medicine. Uh, he completed his residency in pediatric at Denver Children's Hospital and completed his fellowship in UCLA. Um, he's board certified in pediatric and uh, pediatric nephrology. Uh, he has published extensively uh, and have given um, a lot of lectures uh, in the field. Um, and he's involved and active in several international pediatric nephrology research collaborators. Um, his special interest is in um, acid-based electrolyte abnormality, acute kidney energy, dialysis, and kidney transplant. Um, this talk uh, will be on uh, novel therapies for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, and specifically will uh, uh, focus on roll-up uh, lipid aphrasis. Uh, I just want to mention uh, at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A session for 10 to 15 minutes. So please um, uh, uh, have your question ready uh, for the end of this talk. Without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Zareski. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, well, let's, let's get started. And I, I think sort of, these are the course objectives here. Hopefully you'll have at the end of the talk, a greater understanding of one, sort of the epidemiology and clinical attributes of FSGS. That's our abbreviation for focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. You'll, I'll give a very brief review of some of the, uh, the poor results of, of drug options to treat FSGS and basically the other options to treat FSGS. And then we'll spend the majority of the time learning a little bit more about lipid apheresis. It's possible mechanism of action and its potential efficacy as a treatment of uh, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. So I'd like to start off with this talk, this, this slide. And for the pediatric nephrologists out there, you'll clearly, I think you would agree without uh, much arguing, um, is that if we could just take away one disease, remove, cure one disease or remove it, it would be FSGS. Um, it's basically a disease that it's, it's a descriptive disease. We really still lack true understanding of the basic pathophysiology. We understand it's a podocytopathy, but we still don't understand how the podocytes attacked or how to protect the podocyte. We lack diagnostic tools that could be used to guide treatment. And you'll see a lot of the treatments, they're empiric, and sometimes the cure is worse than the true disease here. I do include this slide, the, the next for the nurse practitioner is whenever I'm training a nurse practitioner FSGS, we eventually get to the point of now what? We've tried all these treatments and what are we left with? And then finally, you can imagine a disease that's almost impossible to treat. And then when you transplant the patient because they've gone to end stage due to the disease, the disease comes back. And you'll note FSGS has a very high recurrence rate. So when we talk about FSGS, often we're a little sloppy with the vernacular, and it, it basically covers a whole spectrum of disease. What we're gonna be talking about today is over here on the left-hand slide side of the, uh, the, the slide, this idea of idiopathic or immunologic driven FSGS. Clearly we recognize on the right side that through hyperfiltration, due to obesity, we can see the same type of scar form. Now, right there in the middle, is a very rare cohort of patients who develop a genetic form of FSGS. This is extremely rare, probably less than 0.01% of, of FSGS, but it, it's given us a tremendous amount of insight. And we've been able to recognize that mutations, all the mutations that lead to FSGS are mutations that are found in the podocyte. 
for the most part. And so therefore we recognize that idiopathic FSGS is a disease of the podocyte. In pediatrics, and this is probably the one disease, you know, a lot of times we borrow stuff from adults. We borrow treatments, we borrow physiology. This is probably one of the few diseases where the adults can borrow from the pediatric experience. So why do I say that? It's the single line item cause of end-stage renal disease in, in children. That is, we can add up all the forms of obstructive uropathy, reflux uropathy, and get there. But FSGS is the single line item that's the most frequent cause of end-stage renal disease leading to dialysis. And then the tricky thing in pediatrics is that we recognize that probably around 30% of patients who have severe FSGS are going to have recurrence in their new kidney. We also recognize in pediatrics that there's been an increase in the, the frequency of FSGS. We've seen a marked increase over the last two decades. We've seen a higher rate in African-Americans. We're not so sure why. And here I mention again that we've had a little bit of a, a nice, I'd say maybe a genetic revolution or evolution in our field. And we've been able to recognize that several forms of FSGS are genetic. We haven't figured out everything, but at least it's helped us point to the podocyte, that if we're going to treat FSGS, we need to somehow protect or treat the podocyte. Here is sort of our you know, Bible for treating uh, steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, which FSGS is part of. And you'll see that most patients are placed on corticosteroid therapy. They'll be put on supportive care with an ACE or an ARB. And if that doesn't work, they'll be on a, a calcineurin inhibitor, either a cyclosporin or tacrolimus. In, our, in practice in pediatrics, roughly about 50% of patients will go on to this group. Well, what about the patients who do not get remission? And you can look at the KDGO, it gives you three choices. Consider CELSEP, which really doesn't work in steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome. High-dose steroids, well, you've already done you know, several months of steroids, or consider enrollment in a, in a randomized controlled trial. So this is always difficult when you see this in guidelines. The good news is, is that we're starting to see more randomized controlled trials. Before I get there, I want to remind you that nephrologists like to come up with complex diagrams. And here, here is this idea of, you know, how do you treat steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome? And you can see we've got a very nice complex diagram of, of pulse mold methylprednisone, a calcineurin inhibitor, maybe a combination of the two, and we have this mixture. The problem is, is that treatment is entirely empiric. That is, we do not know which patients are going to possibly respond to pulse solumedrol, calcineurin inhibitors. It's totally empiric. And then the other problem is that the treatments that we have are largely ineffective. You just have to look in red here, the patients that are not able to go into remission, you can see that while calcineurins are the best we have, you still, right, we're only getting about a 50% response rate. And then, you know, adding to that is this very high rate of recurrence. Now, the good news is maybe if we went back five years ago, the chances of you being able to put your patient in a randomized control trial were small. Now we have many more trials opening up to treat. And, we, you know, we just got a new drug a tree for, uh, approved for IgA nephropathy. That drug will also probably see some use in FSGS. So I think we're going to see some new drugs come on. This is just to remind me to remind you that there are several studies going on. And there's, there's the this, this study of, of Sparsantin, which was just approved for IgA now being studied for FSGS. So we are seeing, we're on that curve now where we're starting to see more and more treatments. This is just reviewing some of the data of Duet. I, I would just take a chance and uh, take a moment and probably look at the data for IgA and look at some of this data for Sparsantin. But it's exciting to be able to say that we have some novel treatments for diseases such as IgA and now FSGS that are, are um, finally becoming available. Okay. I put this slide up here to remind me that what I'm about to present is largely a collection of anecdotes. And although it's multi-centered data, it, it, it falls into the same idea that, you know, we have a potential treatment of FSGS through lipid apheresis, but we're still lacking significant amount of data. And I bring up Abatacept because Abatacept was initially, you know, came to the forefront, you know, a couple centers had used it to treat five patients or four patients uh, in uh, basically steroid resistant um, 
nephrotic syndrome. But when it came to repeating those results in clinical practice, there was really no luck. And when it, even when they tried to study it prospectively, they had a very difficult time completing the trial. So what about FSGS? And if you know anything about FSGS, you know, in nephrology, we've been looking for a molecule called the permeability factor. What is this permeability factor? Well, I can show you just with this one slide here. This is almost a thought experiment that was carried out. Um, on the left-hand axis, you have GFR. Uh, on the right-hand axis, you have proteinuria. And in the first part, labeled under patient one, a patient with a history of FSGS received a kidney transplant. What ended up happening is, if you look at the blue line, the kidney never really started working normally. And in fact, the GFR really dropped off significantly. That was due to recurrence of FSGS. That is this permeability factor present the supposed permeability factor present in this patient immediately attacked the new kidney. And despite some valiant efforts to try to get the kidney sort of rescued from this recurrent FSGS, they realized the writing was on the wall. And amazingly, at day 14, they removed that allograft from the first patient and transplanted into another patient, patient two, who did not have a history of FSGS. All of a sudden, the proteinuria disappeared and the kidney started working. And there's actually a pediatric case of this. I keep promising myself to make that slide. I haven't done it yet. But a, a pediatric case where the patient was aneuric for one year, uh, for one month before they took the kidney out and gave it to another patient that started working. So there's something, something about a patient with FSGS, a, a subcategory, a, a, a grouping of FSGS patients that have this permeability factor that as soon as you put a new kidney in, the disease comes back. What about uh, therapeutic plasma exchange to remove this possible permeability factor here? And you can see that we really don't have great evidence to support TP in FSGS, although in recurrent FSGS, it's the, it's the go-to. It's sort of the standard of care. And I throw this slide up here just to remind you that we have no randomized control trial showing this, just four controlled trials. And the reported remission rate, you know, and it, it varies you know, from centers, centers around 50%. And I just bring that up because I, I think that, you know, before, you know, not only do we need more data for lipidapheresis, which I'll get to in a second, but we need more data for just standard, the, the current standard of care. So what about the search for the permeability factor for FSGS? Really the, the Savin lab worked for quite a while trying to find it. And, and really the, 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 the trail has, has, gone, uh, has gotten cold, has gotten cold. We got very excited uh, a couple of years ago, looking at SUPAR as the possible permeability factor. Initial studies were suggesting that patients with FSGS had very high levels of SUPAR here. This was also when we looked at large, uh, uh, large groups of, of patients and registries also had high levels. There was even this idea that if you could remove FS, you, you could aphorese the patient and get their supar level down, you could actually rescue them. However, much like the story with Abatacep, it was very difficult to replicate these studies. And while there are still some groups who believe as supar as being the permeability factor, the field has sort of moved on. And probably supar is more a sensitive uh, biomarker for CKD progression rather than anything else at this point. Now, I just want to uh, let you know that you know, people are still interested in SUPAR. And this shows you how far the field has advanced and how we're really getting to be able to study FSGS. This was a, a study where they actually took peripheral bone marrow cells from patients with FSGS, isolated them, and injected them into mice, humanized mice, and were able to create a xenograft mice with the peripheral bone marrow cells of healthy and patients with FSGS. And they were actually able to create a mouse model of FSGS. That's how you know, how, how much we're, we're moving in the field and studying FSGS. And you can see when they went to look at these mice, obviously they had uh, um, tremendous amounts of proteinuria and they also had high levels of SUPAR, much like we saw in, in, in humans with, with FSGS. I show this more just to show you that, hey, we're getting there um, with being able to study animal models of FSGS. 
I will also mention that, you know, this idea of uh, that, you know, the disease comes from the peripheral bone marrow. There's Stanford is actually has done a couple uh, peripheral bone marrow transplants in patients with FSGS being able to rescue the patient um, and transplant them from the same donor, meaning they're able to basically get rid of the FSGS, transplant the patient. That patient doesn't need immunosuppression because they have a chimeric bone marrow with the donor. So that's exciting stuff. So moving forward, let's talk about the liposorber system. It's essentially uh, an approved system for treating hyperlipidemia and also carries another indication for uh, FSGS. It's basically filtration-based apheresis, and it's selective apheresis. When I say selective apheresis, what does that mean? Essentially, blood is withdrawn from the patient. It's heparinized. So if you're familiar with dialysis, it's a very similar situation. It's then run through a column, which is a plasma separator. So as opposed to regular TPE, where you use a centrifuge to separate out the plasma, here we use a filter. That plasma is then run through a liposorber column. The plasma is then returned to the patient. So we call it selective apheresis in the way that we're not taking wholesale, removing plasma and dumping it down the drain, but here we're actually filtering that plasma and returning to the patient. What's in the column? Well, the column was designed with cellulose beads and a negatively charged dextran sulfate with the idea that it could bind the positively charged lipoprotein seen in familial hypercholesteremia. So why lip liposorber and FSGS? Well, there's quite a bit of um, uh, literature from Japan basically showing that when they treated patients with FSGS due to hyperlipidemia, they were able to rescue a sub a subpopulation out and get those patients into remission. And probably the, 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 the most studied is this paper from uh, Hattori et al. And this is the paper that Kanika brought to the FDA to ask for uh, FDA approval. I'll go into details in, of that study. It's a retrospective study, but it's very interesting um, in that they treated 11 patients with biopsy-proven FSGS who are non-responsive to prednisone and cyclosporine, the calcineurin channel inhibitor at the time. And you can see the patients here. They all had steroid resistance. Uh, they all had tremendous amounts of proteinuria and albumin. These are patients that you know, you know, that are very difficult to treat, that really left untreated will just go to end state very quickly. They all agreed in Japan to use this course of lipid apheresis, where basically an induction phase of two sessions a week for three weeks, and then a second course of one section a week for six weeks. And you'll note they reintroduced prednisone. So 12 treatments over nine weeks, and then they slowly wean the steroids, and you can see here are the results. Amazingly, of these treatment-resistant patients, seven out of the 11, right, all the circles basically either went into a partial or a true remission. Now, like FSGS, we recognize this isn't just probably one disease. Four patients were not responsive. Now, what was amazing about these patients is, and it was a retrospective study, but it went on for quite, you know, they looked back quite a far away, is that if you went into remission, for the most part, you seem to stay there. So you were able to take a disease that was almost untreatable and treat it and put them into a permanent remission, almost a cure. What about the patients that did not respond? Well, those four patients, unfortunately, all went on to end-stage renal disease, which is not surprising. So what predicted a response? Un uh, once again, we're, de we're left with this idea that it's an empiric treatment. Really, we, there's really nothing that predicted a response. We did just see that the less tubular interstitial lesions you had on biopsy, the better you responded. But that made sense, right? Because you had less scarring, the, 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 you, know, you had more kidney to work with. There was this selectivity of proteinuria, which we really don't follow anymore. They had one complication, a line infection. Obviously, severe limitations. It was a retrospective study. Uh, prone to selection bias, small numbers. You could say, well, maybe some of these patients went into spontaneous remission, but if you're a nephrologist has ever treated FSGS, you'd recognize that wasn't possible. And then, of course, it's complicated because they reintroduced prednisone into a group that were previously prednisone non-responsive. And we'll get back to that in a little while. So the question is, is why would this treatment work? Why would lipoprotein apheresis work to treat FSGS? And I don't have an answer for you. I have a hypothesis perhaps, but these are the reasons that have been put forward here, you know, why it would work. I think probably most of us would be interested, could lipid apheresis be removing 
this vascular permeability factor. That is, if it's a positively charged molecule, it's bound by the column. Perhaps it's lipid bound. So as you remove the lipids, you're able to remove it. It's also possible that we recognize that the, the, the free fatty acids compete with cyclosporin and, and tacrolimus to get into the cell. So you can imagine a scenario where if you're able to lower free fatty acids through lipoprotein apheresis, more cyclosporin gets in the cell and you can put the patient in remission. The, the bottom line is we really don't understand why lipoprotein apheresis would work to treat FSGS. We do recognize there's a, there's a linkage between disordered lipids and CKD, that abnormal lipids lead to progressive renal disease, and it becomes a vicious cycle that you certainly do not want to have to deal with hyperlipidemia or hypercholesteremia when you have a, a, a renal disease. It just leads to progressive, more progressive renal disease. One of the things I've been interested in is this idea that maybe the elevated lipids that we see and honestly largely ignore for FSGS and, and, and uh, other forms of nephrotic syndrome are part of the pathogenesis of the disease. And one of the links there is this idea that, you know, recently it was discovered that elevated levels of triglyceride you know, were due, we were able to figure out why there's elevated levels of triglycerides in, in uh, FSGS and nephrotic syndrome. And I'll just point to this paper here. They were able to demonstrate in this paper that due to the, the lowering of albumin in the serum, which normally buffers free fatty acids, free fatty acids went up. That then increased the level of a hormone called angiopotin like four, which normally inhibits lipoprotein lipase. And therefore it makes sense, right? If you're inhibiting lipoprotein lipase, right? You don't need to chop up tri, you know, the uh, triglycerides anymore. Your triglyceride levels go up. And that finally linked nephrotic syndrome to elevated triglycerides. We still don't understand why we see hypercholesteremia. They also went on to show in this paper that angiopotin like four expression in podocytes induced proteinuria. So that it was a, a sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once the angiopotin like four went up, you had worsening proteinuria, which then caused more angiopotin like four. And this is sort of this maladaptive response, which eventually caused podocyte loss. And so therefore, if you have an initial injury to the podocyte that leads to albinuria, hyperlipidemia, and this increase in free fatty acids, increase in angiopotin like four, more proteinuria, more damage to the podocyte, and it's this vicious cycle. And so they propose in this paper that maybe the reason lipoprotein apheresis works is by turning off that, that vicious cycle, right? You could improve renal function and allow the podocyte to recover from whatever injury it had initially received. Now, obviously, it doesn't explain every, uh, you know, every cause of FSGS, but maybe a large, a, a large number. And in some sense, you could make the argument, you know, using this, you know, it's not proven yet that nephrotic syndrome is sort of uh, is a common, you know, not nephrotic syndrome itself represents a common endpoint for podocyte injury. So there could be one of a thousand ways to damage the podocyte immunologically, for example. But once you damage the podocyte, there's this irreversible podocyte injury. And then, you know, to, to the, in theory, the only way you could help the patient is by going in and artificially lowering free fatty acids. So what evidence do I have? That? And, and of course, I've simplified the, 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 uh, the scenario here just to make it convenient to me, explain it, for me to explain it. But it, another group argues that there's several forms of angiopotin like four one that's produced by podocytes causes proteinuria, the other is protective. And we haven't heard much more from this story. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of data looking at angiopotin like four in humans. There's just limited stuff looking at that. You know, indeed, patients with FSGS definitely have a high level of angiopotin like four, although we do see a signal in patients with minimal change in, in membranous nephropathy, though. When we look at, uh, in, in mouse models, indeed, angiopotin-like 4 is expressed by the podocyte in the mouse glomerulus. And indeed, in, when you do cause uh, injury through a mouse model of, of glomerular injury, you see a rapid increase of angiopotin-like 4 staining. And then several days later, you see uh, uh, an increase in 24-hour protein. And in fact, if you treat these animals with a calcineurin inhibitor, you're able to get angiopotin like four to drop. In humans, we do know 
that when we, we, we stain through patients with minimal change or membranous FSGS, we do see angiopotin-like 4. But here you can see, clearly, we do see quite a bit of urinary angiopotin-like 4 in just minimal change itself. So it's not specific for FSGS. And then looking for you know, angiopotin-like 4 in patients with FSGS and different levels, the only thing you know, I was able to find in the literature was a study of adult renal uh, transplant patients they were looking at a single polymorphism or, or two polymorphisms in angiopotin like four and try to associate it with post-transproteinuria, post-transplant proteinuria. And when they looked grossly, they found that uh, this, this, this variant, right, that's associated with lower triglyceride levels, right? Meaning the angiopotin like four doesn't, you know, doesn't work as, as well, had a protective effect, had, had a protective effect. So we really don't have a clear answer. And I more present this, this idea to the idea is that perhaps, you know, if we figured out why lipoprotein apheresis works in treating FSGS, we can go backwards and really investigate why. And one potential answer is that by correcting abnormal lipid, uh, lipid uh, metabolism, we're able to treat FSGS, that there's some linkage, you know, and all, all this time that we've been ignoring you know, abnormal lipid metabolism in FSGS, we should have been paying attention because really the etiology or the pathogenesis of the disease is linked with this abnormal lipid metabolism. Okay, let me move on um, and talk more about using the machine. The machine carries a humanitarian device exemption. What does that mean? It's authorized to treat both uh, adult and pediatric patients with these criteria here, either, and, and I'll, I'll go into it a little bit more, patients who basically are at the end of the line, you've tried everything else, and that's pre-transplant, or any patient who has FSGS uh, recurrence post-transplant. And as part of the uh, approval, the FDA mandated both a pediatric and an adult study, this post-approval trial study, uh, basically two entry criteria. One is you have FSGS with a GFR greater than uh, 45, and you, you really were at the end of the line. That is, you had refractory nephrotic syndrome in which, in which the standard treatment options were unsuccessful. And then you can see below, any post-transplant patient with nephrotic syndrome is eligible to enter the trial. And here's the, the trial. I won't spend any time talking about the results. The trial is still in, in uh, process. It's been very difficult to recruit patients to this trial, like a lot of FSGS patients, but essentially they adopted the same um, treatment algorithm as that Japanese study where you have 12 treatments over a nine-week treatment course. Now, I'm just going to show you some of my data from two of the patients I enrolled, and, and that's more to transition to a, a treatment protocol that we've developed to treat post-treatment F post-treatment recurrent FS post-transplant recurrent FSGS using the lipid using lipid apheresis. And these were two patients, teenage patients that we treated. And you can see the patient in blue actually lost quite a bit of weight as the weight using a surrogate marker as, as remission. And this patient stayed in remission. The second patient here, as soon as I took them off, they relapsed. And while I was waiting, uh, and I thought, well, I'll put a fistula into the patient and, and, and treat this patient long term, I said, you know what, while the fistula is healing, why don't I treat them with steroids? Where the first treatment protocol, I hadn't used any steroids. This time I reintroduced steroid to the nine week treatment course. And here using, oops, what did I do here? Here, um, this time I reintroduced steroid treatment and indeed the albumin normalized and this patient went into remission. So using this, we came up with a, a protocol that um, myself, the group in Cincinnati, and two groups in England agreed to use to treat post-transplant recurrent FSGS. Essentially, we all used two sessions a week for the first three weeks. One group used three sessions a week for the first week, then one session a week for the next six weeks. But what we did differently than the, the, the post-approval trial is we reintroduced pulse solumedrol, approximately 10 milligrams per kilogram each time after the, the, the weekly session. And this is the first patient we treated here. You notice this is the, a log of urinary protein to creatinine ratio, very high urinary protein to creatinine ratios, right? Normal is down here at 0.2. This patient had been treated with plasmapheresis, had undergone rituximab treatment. And the only thing that put that patient into remission was, you guessed it, LDL apheresis. And the patient stayed in remission. This shows you the seven other patients that were treated between the, the four groups. 
you can see all patients had received quite a bit of immunosuppression. One patient had even received a batacept. Everybody had been on plasmapheresis. You can look at the duration of post-transplant apheresis here. So one patient had been on post-transplant apheresis for 18 months, 18 months prior to coming to LDL apheresis. And here's the total treatment of LDL therapy. Initially, we we're unsure of how long to treat the patient, but eventually we just went back to that Hattori protocol of just nine weeks. I won't show you some of the other results from the patients, but everybody, you know, it was beginner's luck, seven out of the seven patients went into remission. Now, since then, we've had some notable uh, failures. This is not a treatment that works in every patient, but this is sort of an, another kind of, you know, get, it basically gave us insight into the, 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 that really uh, lipid apheresis is a possible treatment for, for, for post-transplant recurrent FSGS. And this was just the, the, this is all published data that all the patients had an excellent GFR and you can see the time to the most recent follow-up was, uh, you know, one patient had been almost two years out without having a significant relapse of their disease. So, I'm now going to transition into, you know, remember the first slide I showed you was that of a Batacept, the idea that, hey, you know, they had this idea, the first four patients, it was a New England paper, that they showed some efficacy using a Batacept to treat FSGS. However, they had a very difficult time replicating those results in the real world. And I have to kind of reintroduce that caution when it comes to bringing up lipid apheresis. Yes, we've published on those seven papers, but that's really a collection of anecdotes. So we really need to move forward with, with a, a controlled trial. And I think by moving through this, uh, we, we're looking to um, do a study through the, um, the IROC collaborative. It's called Improving Renal Outcomes Collaborative. It was founded in, in 2016 uh, with 15 uh, transplant programs. There's now 43. So it's a very large cohort of pediatric um, transplant patients, and they collect data prospectively, and you can see how many active patients. I think the big thing is, here's some of the centers, is that they covered in 2021, 61% of the, the US uh, kidney transplants were performed at an IROC center. So this is the center we're gonna leverage to basically do a randomized control trial comparing the standard of care which of course would be TPE on the right-hand side to the study arm, which would include LDL apheresis. So we're hopeful that we're actually gonna have some randomized controlled trials, trial data at the end of the study with data, not only, well, have some novel data just on the efficacy of TPE done in a prospective trial, but also comparing TPE to LDL apheresis. Now, the study will also include, include crossover arms. That is, if you don't respond to TPE, right, if you remain proteinuric, right, we would then, you'd, you'd be able to cross over into the LDL. And, and, and inversely, if you didn't respond to LDL, you would come into the TPE. So we're excited to be able to leverage this, the IROC, which I said covers over 50% of the transplants in the country, to really push forward and hopefully be able to do a study where we compare in a randomized controlled fashion, standard of care, therapeutic plasma exchange versus LDL apheresis. So we still haven't gotten the, the trial up and running, but that's, that's our hope. And we're also hopeful to include some adult patients as well. So uh, I went a little bit quickly, but that will give us some time for questions. So as I mentioned, there's, there's several novel yet untested therapies for FSGS. It's sort of an exciting time for uh, nephrology in that if for several of the sort of untreatable diseases in the past, including IgA and FSGS, we're starting to see new therapies come on the market. So it's exciting. There's several ongoing trials. One of them, of course, is lipoprotein apheresis, the post-approval trial, which is in pediatrics about halfway through recruitment. I don't know the, the adult side. I will have to just, you know, give a little pause and say, hey, we really don't understand the possible mechanism of action why lipid apheresis would work in FSGS, although there is this kind of, you know, I'm excited at least about connecting the abnormal lipid metabolism uh, with, the, with the pathogenesis, um, and it would help to explain why lipid apheresis would work. Uh, I will mention that I think this, this rescue protocol, where we combined the Hattori protocol of 12 treatments over nine weeks with this pulse solumedrol during the last six treatments, has shown promise 
Uh, that that uh, data is published in pediatric nephrology. There was just seven patients, but it was it was uh, four centers at least. And then I'm very very hopeful. I'm very hopeful that in the next couple of years we'll be able to get this trial off the ground where we compare the standard of care, which we don't have great data for therapeutic plasma exchange to lipid a, uh, lipoprotein apheresis in a randomized control fashion within this IROC, this pediatric uh, nephrology kidney transplant research uh, or collaborative. Okay, I think we can open it up to questions. I'm going to leave this up here for you. This is the uh, that just to remind you that the CME and MOC credits are available online through Opus Medicus. This is where you go to on your uh, uh, browser, opusmedicus.com slash CMEs. And I'll leave this slide up while we take questions. So it will be up for uh, at least 10 minutes to claim credit. You go to exam, evaluation, and the certificates. Uh, and there the slides are available. So if you uh, attended the web webinar, obviously you don't you just saw them, but if you, you want to recommend the course to someone else, they can go through it as well. So I'll stop there. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Zaretsky. Uh, sure. Excellent talk. So um, uh, the Q&A session is, in, uh, is now, so I'll start just with a question that I have. Um, in our center, we do a freezes. Nephrology is in charge of the all modality of a freezes, and we have done... Uh, uh, LDL freezes on adults, and uh, we actually enrolled five patients in adult site for the for the study that was done by the sponsor. Um, my question is: um, Do you look at the uh, level of their lipids, like um, the LDL or the total cholesterol, to predict if this treatment will work for them? Yeah, um, I mean that that's that, that's exactly you know that that it's an it's a wonderful question because. When we looked at the paper, we couldn't find anything. You know, everybody obviously responded in the paper, so it's hard to tell who's going to respond and who's not. But I can tell you anecdotally, I haven't been able to find, uh, you know, oh, a lipid cutoff that if your lipids is higher than this, you're going to respond or not. You know, so we lack, we still lack that that data to tell us, you know, hey, you should undergo lipid apheresis or you shouldn't undergo lipid apheresis. The only thing we've been able to get out of using lipid apheresis is recognizing that if your GFR is below 45, most likely you're not, you're, it's, it's, you've lost too much kidney function that you're not going to respond no matter what. So we still don't have predictors. So like many of the other treatments for, you know, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome slash FSGS, you know, whatever you want to throw at the patient, it's all empiric treatment and lipid apheresis is no different. I just think for post-transplant, you know, where you have this scenario where you've just put a new graft in someone, you've invested a lot of time and energy and it's recurrent. This treatment really shows, you know, some promise, really shows some promise. Now, I don't want to say, well, you know, don't do TPE because TPE is our standard of care. But when you look, you know, the patients we had in the trial, one patient had been on TPE for 18 months. You know, so there's clearly some patients that will not respond to TPE that will respond to lipid apheresis. And Amir and I were talking prior to the, um, you know, the uh, me giving the lecture, and I asked him, "Hey, what have you used this 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 alternative steroid protocol? You know, and uh, you know maybe that's the that's the thing that's going to help your patients, Amir. That if you reintroduce that pulse solumedrol during those last six treatments, that's how you know that's how I was able to be successful. That before adding the steroids, you know, I had that one patient who just relapsed immediately. And it wasn't until I added the steroids back, like the Hattori paper, right? Like the Hattori paper that I was able to put that patient into remission. And indeed those first seven patients we treated, that's what seemed to, that combination of steroids along with lipid apheresis, that's what put them into remission. Interesting. And um, that brings us to this, um, if, if somebody cannot tolerate the steroid or there's a contraindication for, yeah. for example, they have, a, um, you know, they're diabetic or they're overweight and so forth. Yeah. So that yeah, makes I, it a little difficult to- uh, Yeah, it's, and I've treated, uh, listen, I, you know, I, when I was at St. Chris, I ended up treating more adults than pediatrics. And, you know, sure enough, one patient I pushed as close to diabetes as I dared, you know, using the pulse cymedrol. The nice thing about the protocol, I'll tell you, it's just six weeks, right? And I see one person asked a question, cymedrol IV times one weekly, yes. And, and I, uh, I started to do a better job explaining that basically that last six weeks of treatment, it's a pulse of a, a one, you know, 10 per kilo. After that, 
apheresis. So you do the, the six treatments, two a week for three weeks, then you have another treatment and you go treatment six every six weeks. And with that treatment, the treatment's followed by a pulse of cyamedrol along with oral steroids. And typically for an adult patient, I'll start them on, give them a pulse, start them on 60 of prednisone, the next week, 50, 40, 30, until I get back to their post-transplant dose, their, their normal post-transplant dose. So that's, that's sort of that, that protocol. And, and clearly there are going to be some patients out there that are, you know, that you can't, you can't use steroids on them. One patient I had who did not go into remission, unfortunately, we know we agreed just to use the oral steroids. Remember the, the Hattori paper just used oral steroids. I've kind of, you know, and I can't tell you how we got to this pulse cyometrol <laughs> trial, uh, how, how we did that, but that's the protocol that we're kind of sticking with. And uh, another question, it says, if it's the lipid as culprit, then why lipid lowering agent do not work? That is a wonderful question. Uh, now, I will tell you, there are some people out there, I don't have any data, I don't think they've published, who have tried to treat um, post-transplant recurrence with, um, with a, P a PCSK9 inhibitor. I will say something about, though, uh, if you're going to compare the efficacy of a lipid-lowering agent compared to lipid apheresis, it's, it's night and day. This treatment is so successful at acutely lowering lipids, much more than you could get with uh, a statin, much more than you could get with a PCESK9 inhibitor. It's just, you know, you'll, you'll if you check lipids after uh, um, a session of lipid apheresis, essentially their cholesterol is zero. You know, the lab calls you and says, well, what's wrong with the sample? We're not able to measure any cholesterol. So I, I don't have an answer why lipid lowering agents would not work. Uh, but I would, I would, I would, I would suppose that it has to do with the efficacy of the treatment that you're you're undergoing. You know, maybe we're lowering something else that is that, that it might it might not be just lipids. It might be the the, the plasma solubility factor. You know, yeah, that could be the, the the plasma solubility factors that that that's what you're lowering. But the lipid lowering agents haven't shown the success. If you look at the data for treating patients with FSGS or nephrotic syndrome with lipid lowering agents, the data is horrible, especially in pediatrics. There's really no data. So often when we have someone with FSGS and they have high cholesterol, we don't do anything about it. You know, And, and, and if you think about it, the reason the Japanese got interested in this treatment is because they wanted to treat the, the, the hyperlipidemia that they saw in nephrotic syndrome. And then just by chance, they noticed some people went into remission. Okay, uh, there is another question in the chat uh, that says a patient that is, um, the GFR is borderline about 45, been on TP for 18 months, and protein is still in about uh, two to three gram, and um, uh, no other side effects. Um, what is it like to have been a candidate? And creatinine is around 1.4 to 1 1.8. Yeah, so, yeah, so this, is, this is a difficult patient. Um, you know, as long as the GFR is over 45 and the patient's stuck on, stuck on therapeutic plasma exchange, my, 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 obviously I'm, I'm biased. This is a, this is a candidate for lipid apheresis. This is a patient that's a candidate for lipid apheresis. You might not be able to use uh, the pulse cymedrol. Maybe you just have to use the oral steroids, but remember it's just a nine week treatment course. This patient's already been on apheresis for 18 months, right? And these are the patients that come to us, right? Come to Amir and myself with the idea they've tried everything and they've been, you know, what's, they've been on apheresis for the 18 months. So yes, a patient like this is a potential candidate. Uh, you'd have to go to a center that has lipid apheresis and you'd have to check to make sure their GFR is above 45. With that low GFR, it's always more difficult, but a creatinine of 1.4 to 1.8 certainly isn't, isn't horrible. Um, and there's always a chance the patient has a little bit of, you know, ongoing AKI due to the ongoing uh, proteinuria. That's not a, a tremendous amount of, pro of proteinuria, but it, it might be worth a, 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 a possibility. And uh, there's a question, how about retox? Retox uh, I, I mean, I mean, I, I think this is, it, you know, it's sort of like, hey, we throw everything at the patient. You know, if you look at the data for treating steroid-resistant nephrotic syndrome, <laughs> um, with retox, there was the, the data is not great. Some people still do it, but the, the data really is not great. Yeah. I don't include it in my protocol. You will notice, though, <laughs> um, you'll notice that 
you know, in the IROC consortium, we're trying to agree upon a, 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 a protocol, you know, that we all do. And in that protocol is as soon as they recur, they get a couple rounds of apheresis and they get a dose of rituximab before they're entered into the trial. So some of us still believe it's part of the treatment of recurrent FSGS is rituximab. And uh, another question I have um, on the practicality of the, the treatment. Yeah. Uh, our patients are, that are on AC inhibitors, I switch them to ARB. Yes. Uh, what you know, what's your experience, Dr. Zorowski? So anybody undergoing lipid apheresis, and I'll say TPE also, need to be off an ACE inhibitor, right? Because there's always a risk of bradykinin reaction with this filter, along with standard TPE, right? We know. So patients cannot be on an ACE. That's, that's a contraindication. They cannot be on an ACE when they undergo treatment. They can, of course, transfer over to an ARB. I'll tell you practically, one of the things someone brought up is, you know, lipid levels. I'll tell you that the machine, if the patient's triglycerides are over 800, it's very difficult to get them through a treatment. The, the, it, those high triglycerides will clog up the filter. So generally, if your triglycerides are over 18, I usually do 800, 800. I'll generally do a round of standard TPE, get the triglycerides under 800, then put them in the, the lipid apheresis treatment uh, protocol. Excellent. Okay. Amir, I, I do want you, I, I want you to talk to, talk to um, Cheryl Sanchez, ask her about her, I know she's used some steroids also, because yeah. I'm wondering if, if that, if adding the steroids is going to be able to augment your, your response, you know? Right. Well, so in adults, we did not do, uh, or we did not pulse them with the steroids. And yeah. As I mentioned earlier before this talk, our response was not that great, but uh, yeah. I think that could be something that we um, kind of add uh, in the future. Yeah. Definitely. All right, let's see more questions. Um, and the data for restore response to CNI after lipid. Yeah, I, I think. And, and I didn't, I didn't touch on any of the data, the pre-transplant data. You know, I didn't touch on any of that. Um, I just talked about post-transplant. I will say that, you know, one of the things about TPE, right, it's indicated for post-transplant recurrence. It's not indicated for pre-transplant, right? The only thing that's indicated for pre-transplant FSGS or primary FSGS truly is lipid apheresis. At least it carries an indication through the, the TPE Bible. I find that, um, you know, for, for whatever reason, these patients, it's not so much that, 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 that they're, um, you know, if they respond to calcineurin inhibitor, great, they, they can stay on it. But, you know, most of these patients, um, almost universally, if they're going to undergo lipid apheresis, they're already on a calcineurin inhibitor and they remain on it. So I would say, yes, if you're resistant to a, a calcineurin inhibitor, you know, uh, your FSGS is resistant, yes, you are a candidate for lipid apheresis. And that would be either pre-transplant, you know, with primary FSGS or post-transplant. Right. Okay. So on the, the last slides where randomized trial was proposed, why would the nah. arm have the combination of both LDLA phase? Amir. Someone's yeah. paying attention out there. Yeah, I, I was actually <laughs> about to tell you that when you said they cross over, that the, the, the people that are in the um, let me go back. Arm, they also on TA. Let me go and back. TV. I love it. I love it. You know what? Yeah. You all, you, sometimes you wonder, you know, is anybody out there? Is, is anybody actually out there? And, and kudos <laughs> to whoever asked that question. Kudos yes. to you. And you'll notice here the standard of care is regular TPE, right? Right. And you can see it does include rituxam. Right? We are undergoing an argument right now what the study arm should include. Right. Now, if it was up to me, I would say the study arm would just be pure lipid apheresis. Pure lipid apheresis. However, Dr. Hooper, who, who runs the IROC Collaborative, is very worried that we won't be able to enroll anybody into this arm without including 
some therapeutic plasma exchange as well. So that people are not willing to, you know, just jump onto the LDL bandwagon. At my center, I would be willing to do it. And you can see here, what he does is at East Center is at, you know, what he does is he does LDL apheresis and then also includes a little bit of TPE. He's not willing to let go of that you know, that's sort of his safety blanket, you know what I mean? Or whatever you want to call it, <laughs> that he wants to keep a little TPE going. Yeah. And I, I have to say, hey, listen, we need to get the study done. So we need to get people into the study arm, you know? So I'm okay with this protocol where we're comparing, you know, because still the difference between these two protocols, right, is the addition of LDLA phoresis. I think, you know, we, we're still going back and forth. So we still haven't agreed exactly what the protocol is going to be. And we need some feedback from the other groups. Indeed, if it turns out that we go with this protocol, clearly at the end of the day, we'll be able to say, well, hopefully LDL and TPE is better than TPE. And then there would be another follow-up study, which would say, hey, we're going to really do it where we can compare LDL to TPE. I think that the comfort level of the other study investigators is not there where they're willing to just go to LDL apheresis completely. So, I, you know, and, and uh, David Hooper and I are going back and forth about, you know, what should we do? I, I just feel like for most, most people out there, you know, what is the standard of care? The standard of care is TPE. We don't have great data, right? We don't have great data to say that TPE, you know, it, it's all worked for us. We all have anecdotal cases where TPE has put people in remission, but we all have patients that have been on TPE for 18 months, like the person here, and it hasn't worked, right? So you have to try something different. So, you know, it's hard if you, you know, it's, it's very hard to introduce change, right? You have to come with data to introduce change into the standard of care. And the field, to, to just generate the initial data, the seven patients, you know, isn't going to cut it. Right. I think we really need to do something like this. And really, I, you know, I do think there's going to be some TPE still in the mix with LDL that people aren't going to feel comfortable cutting TPE cold turkey. You know, so I, I don't have I, I really appreciate that question. And it makes me feel better that you were, you know, you're really paying attention during my talk there to say, hey, well, wait a second, Dr. Zariski, you're not comparing you know, apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges and apples, you know, that's, that's what you're doing here. But, uh, you know, it's, it's the real world. I don't think we're going to have, I don't think, I, whereas our, it, it would be even difficult at my center at Phoenix Children's for me to go to the head of transplant and say, you know what, we're just going to put that patient in lipid apheresis. You know, I, I think I would still have a hard time convincing them. At other centers, you know, when we had time, we were able to get patients into just lipid apheresis versus TPE, but I, we're just not there yet. We're not there yet, unfortunately. But I'm hoping this study will be a stepping stone, right? I, I'm also hopeful that this study is going to give us some real data that will go into the apheresis Bible, you know, randomized control trial as, you know, how well does apheresis work as the standard of care, so to speak. Not uh, the question, but the comment. and. Um... On adult side, basically, uh, if we if we had somebody post transplant with FSGS and responded to plasma exchange, in my ex experience, if you stop the TPE cold turkey, as you mentioned, there is a higher chance of recurrence, and as right. as, as as opposed to uh, tapering off the TPE. Right, case. right. So and it's it's hard to it's hard to know. It's hard to know. I, I I'm I'm hopeful that with this. This this current design, we'll see a signal here on the LDL apheresis arm. We'll see a signal versus the TPE. And, and I might be coming back to you in six months saying, hey, you know what? The group is willing to go, uh, and the IRB will approve us randomizing patients into pure LDL apheresis. The, the FDA, at least for the HDE exemption, has said, hey, you're allowed to use you know, lipid apheresis. It's, it's indicated in post-transplant recurrence you know, in recurrent disease. So um, you're allowed to use, you know, you can still use that HD approval to treat patients like that. But, you know, I, I, I still, you know, we're still going back and forth on this. And I, I'm not hopeful that patient, you know, that if I went to Amir and I said, hey, you have a fresh transplant who has FSGS recurrent, Amir, do a lipid apheresis on them. You know, would you feel comfortable doing that? Well, that's a difficult question to answer, right? 
because you're post transplant, you have, you know, you, you want to get that patient into remission as, as soon as possible. You don't want more and more injury to delay or causing delayed graft function, which we can all see in FSGS. So I don't know if I went to Amir who's had some experience with lipidapheresis and then say, hey, I want you to put him into this LDL only protocol. I don't know if he'd buy it. He might be more willing to buy this type of protocol where there's some apheresis TPE still included. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think the TP to uh, LDL will be something I would go for. Yeah. All right. Um, there is no other question in the chat. Um, this was an excellent talk, Dr. Zdrowski. We really enjoyed your your talk and your uh, especially the part that you added the steroid. To the, yes. Uh, the protocol and that's that's unique i never heard of it so excellent talk to your group talk to your group because i know um cheryl sanchez has done it before uh, uh yeah definitely i will all right excellent okay thanks for paying attention everybody <laughs>